this talk is also going to be uh, like Liat's talk a, um, a methodological talk and we're going to I'm going to uh, address the same kinds of questions but I'm going to get to a slightly different conclusion and I have bad news for Liad because I think that um, ecological uh, stimuli are passe my children spend like 75 percent of their time <laughs> on a 2D uh, screen so uh, we're going to stick to uh, old stimuli so um, before I start I would like you to read this short paragraph, which is uh, typical of most introductions uh, on the study of unconscious processing. And basically, uh, it states that the aim of um, comparing um, conscious and unconscious processing is to understand the functions of consciousness. But what is implied in this text is that in order to do that, it is only uh, sufficient to demonstrate a significant effect of unconscious processing. So if we find, for instance, that I'm able to understand a word that I don't see consciously, then the conclusion is that I don't need conscious perception in order to read this word. And I think this is quite a jump for uh, two reasons. The first reason is that um, as uh, Liad showed us, the, the effects of unconscious processing, and especially of high-level uh, unconscious processing, uh, are usually very small. Uh, just to give, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, just to give a few examples, um, unconscious processing effects of less than 10 milliseconds are the rule. And nevertheless, the interpretation is uh, very striking. Unconscious primes activate motor codes through semantics. Mass primes can genuinely semantically be semantically processed. A picture prime study we see here, uh, a maximum of eight, nine milliseconds. Now, this problem is uh, compounded by the fact that the standard par paradigm that is uh, typically used in order to demonstrate unconscious processing uh, runs a high risk of underestimating <coughs> conscious processing. Um, I will first describe this paradigm, uh, taking, for example, uh, the um, seminal study by Stan Dehan, and then explain why I think that it underestimates, oh, sorry. I don't know what I did here. Just one second. I can take my glasses so I can see anything. <laughs> OK, thanks, sorry. OK, so most of you know this paradigm. It's, um, you start with the main phase, which is the experimental phase. And in this phase, um, subjects see uh, this typical sequence of events. You have a prime, and this prime is masked. It appears for a small amount of time. And uh, the parameters are fixed such that uh, people won't even be aware of its presence. And then you have a target. And uh, in this particular case, uh, the task of the subjects was to decide whether uh, the target was smaller or larger than five. And uh, the prime could also be smaller or larger than five. And the critical uh, finding is whether responses to the target are going to be influenced by uh, the prime. That is, if they're congruent, we're going to be faster than if they are incongruent. And, uh, the subjects are not even alerted to the fact that the prime is there at all. So they have absolutely no notion that it's there. And then to verify that, maybe I'm going to use this thing. Oop. No. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, to, oh, it's only a pointer. Yeah, it's only a pointer. Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right. Uh, no, it's OK. And then you have a second phase that comes at the end of the experiment in which you want to verify that indeed the prime was not consciously perceived. And uh, in this case, we have exactly the same sequence of events, but instead of asking something about the target, now the subject knows that there was a prime and they're asked about the prime. And here there's a variety of different um, methods in order to verify the uh, conscious perception of the prime. Uh, it's usually a discrimination task, and if you have uh, if your responses are at chance, then you decide that the prime was not consciously perceived in the main experiment. 
OK? So there's a, div a diversity of different uh, types of uh, discrimination tasks that are used. The most stringent one would be to ask about the very presence of the prime. But it is very rare to find um, such experiments, and possibly because of what Liad was talking about, if you reduce the visibility of the prime to the level where people cannot even say whether it's here or not, you're going to have very little to work with for your unconscious processes. So what has become more and more popular in the literature is what is called the direct-indirect match uh, criterion, which means that if the uh, property of the stimulus that's relevant for my in, uh, uh, un unconscious processing is whether or not the prime is larger or smaller than 5, then this is the kind of discrimination for which the subject should be at chance in order for me to decide that he's not conscious of what's important for the task. And this is um, <coughs> the task that is usually used. And as I will uh, show, this task is problematic because look at what's going on. In this phase, I expect something that's not visible to affect my judgments on something that's visible. But then I ignore the fact that in this phase, I expect, I, <coughs> I ignore the fact that something that's highly visible is going to affect my responses at something that's minimally visible. Okay, so what it means is that if I unknowingly respond to the target because it's more salient than the prime on a large proportion of trials, I'm going to be at chance on the prime discrimination because they're orthogonal one to the other, which means that I'm going to have spurious chance performance, and this is usually overlooked. There are other uh, important uh, criticisms about uh, this paradigm. One is, of course, that in order to, uh, to, to decide that I'm at chance, all right, my D prime is zero, what is called the null sensitivity problem, I need a lot of trials, which I usually don't have in these experiments. And, uh, <coughs> and most uh, importantly, uh, the two uh, measures that are relevant for uh, my, my conclusion, that is the measure of priming, and the measure of consciousness are obtained under different conditions at different moments. And this is the task comparati compar comparability problem, which means that uh, I might be in a totally different state during the awareness phase. And Rauder and Pratt have uh, shown uh, con convincing evidence that when people are faced with this kind of task, in which basically most of the time they see something really faint, they lose motivation in performing the task, which means that they are going to have uh, more or less random um, uh, um, responses to the, to the prime, which is not at all the case here because they have a very clear task to perform, and so their alertness is much higher. So the first problem we have is that the standard subliminal prime paradigm is likely to underestimate consci uh, conscious perception, which means that the small effects we see might come from just a few trials in which the subject was aware, and we cannot draw very strong conclusions from this. The second problem is that, just to remind the text you, wrote, you, you, you read at the beginning, what we're really looking at is to what extent, sorry, to what extent conscious and unconscious processing are different. And in order to do that, you need to compare conscious and unconscious processing. The problem is that with the centered paradigm, the prime is always subliminal. And therefore, there's no uh, conscious uh, condition to which you can compare it. Now, of course, um, the implications of the comparison are really important. Suppose you find a 15 millisecond unconscious priming effect, which is on the high uh, <coughs> side of, uh, of the distribution of, uh, uh, of effects in, the, in, this, uh, in this field. The implications of this finding are going to be completely different if when you compare it to a conscious condition, you get this result, which means that there is no effect of conscious perception. Uh, of, uh, of conscious perception on the process you're uh, uh, investigating versus this uh, result, which would mean that conscious perception contributes very highly to this process. 
Um, so um, there have been a lot of research uh, actually comparing subliminal and supraliminal um, priming. And here is an example of this. So in this, uh, in this um, research, what people are comparing, what, what the authors are comparing is a uh, condition in which subjects are at chance at discriminating the, the, um, the, stim the critical stimulus, whereas they have a condition in which uh, there is no mask, and so the, uh, uh, the stimulus is completely visible. And what you can see is that we have a very, very small effect here, and we have a huge effect when people are conscious of, um, of the stimulus. And yet, the title of the paper is Prior Expectations, Modulus Repetition Suppression Without Perceptual Awareness. And we get effects of rep repetition probability regardless of prime awareness. So there are, there is a, a tradition of very strong conclusions based on very small effects. And when you compare conscious to unconscious perception, you see that the difference is huge. But of course, it doesn't seem to be surprising here because the stimuli are very different. So a more interesting case, which um, I will present here, is the case where instead of showing graded differences between conscious and unconscious processing, you actually show a dissociation between conscious and unconscious processing. And this is an old study, uh, a very early study by Greenwald, um, who um, studied uh, unconscious priming, compared it to conscious priming. So the unconscious stimuli were again masked, whereas the conscious stimuli were unmasked. And what they showed is that when you manipulate the time between the mask stimulus and the target, the unconscious effect disappears completely, whereas the conscious effect actually grows. Okay. So we have a uh, uh, um, dissociation here, but the problem is that we don't know where it comes from. What is important here? Uh, consciousness per se. So consciousness <coughs> grow, uh, 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 with a conscious stimulus, my processing grows, and the effect on behavior is growing, whereas when I'm not conscious, the effect is going down. Or masking impairs the development of, um, of uh, my processing of the stimulus, and this is why we get this dissociation. So without a comparison between conscious and unconscious processing with exactly the same stimuli, finding significant unconscious priming does not tell us much about the function of consciousness. So in recent years, uh, a number of labs have been using a different uh, paradigm, a modification of the standard paradigm, which we call the liminal prime paradigm, and which attempts to solve these problems. So in the liminal par prime paradigm, we have a very uh, similar sequence of events, except that on each trial, subjects first have to um, respond as fast as possible to the target, but then they have to rate the visibility of the prime on a scale from 0 to, not, to 4. Sorry, 0 to 3. Uh, this, is the, um, this is a modification of the perceptual awareness scale um, by uh, Overgaard, uh, who uses a scale from 1 to 4, but our subjects found it more intuitive to rate absolute uh, absence of visibility by 0 than by 1. And so 0 would mean I don't see anything. 1, I have a glimpse that something was happening on the screen, but I couldn't say anything about it. Two is a uh, almost clear vision, and three is a clear vision of what the prime was. Now, what happens here is that we get two responses on each trial. Now, this paradigm has a number of advantages. The first advantage, of course, is that it allows comparing conscious and unconscious processing with exactly the same stimuli. And so if I look at zero, this would be my unconscious condition. And then if I look at uh, ratings of two or three, this would be my uh, <coughs> conscious condition. We usually drop the rating one because we have found it to be like the trash bag in which subjects um, <coughs> use when uh, they were inattentive or um, did not uh, know what to do with the task at, in this particular trial. So we usually compare zero to, uh, to two, three ratings. <coughs> 
uh, <coughs> it compares conscious and unconscious processing in exactly the same trials and under the same attention condition because basically both the prime and the target are going to be uh, um, attended and we have no task compa comparability problem. It also measures subjective experience at the lowest point, at zero. Now you could speak about the um, um, criterion problem, thank you, <laughs> about the criterion problem, but it, uh, several studies have shown that when you have several possible responses in order to express the fact that you're not sure what you saw, uh, zero visibility corresponds to chance performance on discrimination. So we're quite confident that zero is the true zero. And <coughs> in addition, it is not so much important in this kind of setting as it is in sublinimal prime paradigm because what we're interested in is the difference between conscious and unconscious. So basically something that will show no difference will be independent of consciousness. And something that will show a huge difference will be dependent of consciousness even if at zero, I do have a small effect. Um, <coughs> the uh, other notable um, advantage is that it actually maximizes our chances to find effect, which is what was worrying uh, uh, um, uh, Liad, because we don't need like savagely sub subliminal uh, primes because we do not need d prime equals to zero. So we can have like stronger stimuli and these stimuli benefit from attention because people have to report on them, okay? So we have uh, run uh, in the past uh, several studies in order to, uh, to validate uh, the paradigm. And this validation is just to show that it is sensitive enough to give the whole scale of different phenomena. So you could have uh, <coughs> instances of processing that do not depend of, on consciousness at all and processes that are completely contingent on them. So here we have an example of attentional capture, which uh, quite obviously does not depend on conscious perception. And another example of updating of an object information in working memory that seems to be completely contingent on contingent capture. On, uh, sorry, on uh, conscious perception. So the objective of the uh, data I'm uh, going to see here, to show you here, uh, are the following. We, we uh, uh, try to uh, re-examine uh, old questions about semantic priming. Uh, the first uh, question that we are asking is to what extent semantic priming actually depends on conscious perception. So as we saw before, there have been um, uh, demonstrations of very small uh, unconscious semantic priming effects. And the question is, how do we interpret these, these effects? Um, do we get something similar when people are conscious of the same stimulus or do we get a big difference between the two? The second is, let's see whether we have unconscious semantic priming at all on zero visibility trials when we avoid the caveats that, that, that are uh, associated with the, sublim uh, the, uh, the um, subliminal prime paradigm. Um, the third question is, well, let's go back to the beautiful dissociation that Greenwald uh, demonstrated with mass versus unmasked stimuli, and let's try to see whether we can actually find a dissociation between the time courses of conscious and unconscious perception. And the last question, which I think is interesting, is supposing that we do find a dissociation between the time course of unconscious and conscious semantic processing. Will that be true? Would we find such a dissociation for every other aspect of the stimulus, including low level aspects? So this is what we tried to do in uh, uh, four experiments. So the basic pattern of um, the experiments with this one, we had uh, numbers as primes and uh, targets, which were masked. And uh, we used the liminal prime paradigm. And we did this in um, four experiments. Um, the, 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 the task was always uh, whether the target is smaller or larger than five. Um, and we had uh, a target set that uh, comprises of four numbers, two, four, six, eight in one group, and one, three, seven, nine in the other group counterbalance. And so we had two types of prime sets. One prime set that uh, 
um, overlaps with the target set, and one prime set that does not overlap with the um, target set, and I will explain later why this is important. So, supposing that your target is four, you have three critical conditions. The first condition is when the prime and the target are, ident are identical. So the prime is four and the target is four. The second kind is when you have compatible and incom incompatible um, uh, digits that are in the target set. So in this example, that would be a prime of two, which has been encountered as a target, would be compatible, whereas a prime six would be incompatible. And you have the same distinction here for um, novel primes, which were never encountered as targets. So uh, this allows us to, oh, I can st constantly tap doing the right, the, sorry. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. So we can uh, measure three kinds of priming. One is repetition priming, which means that we compare the case where the prime is identical and the case where it's different, but it is compatible, and it is part of the used um, uh, uh, prime set, which means that in this case, what we will obtain is a comparison between conscious and unconscious basic perceptual priming, which um, perceptual processing, which is not confounded not with conceptual uh, processing or re 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 response selection, because the same response is elicited by the two stimuli. Uh, the next uh, uh, priming we can... Uh, Fine is response priming. So as I told you before, that it is important to distinguish between used and novel primes because when the subjects perform the task with practice, they're going to form associations, direct associations between the perceptual uh, representation of the prime and the response associated with it because they learn it by associating the same representation of the target with the correct response. So at some stage, the conceptual analysis or the semantic analysis, if you want, of the prime can be bypassed and we have like stimulus response binding that are going to be automatically retrieved and <coughs> this will be, um, this will be uh, um, reflected in compatibility effects with use primes that are different from the prime, from the target. And then we have semantic priming in which such associations are not going to help me perform the task. And if I genuinely process the, target, the, the prime unconsciously to the semantic level, I should get semantic priming. So we ran four experiments. We had novel, where are the escape here, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, uh, we had novel and um, and used for, I don't know where your escape, if you just show me where escape is, this is Encho, that's the problem. You don't have an escape? Uh, yeah, there. Oh, uh, okay. I see, it, it runs from one to the other, I see, okay. So uh, we have uh, one experiment for novel primes, and two, two experiments for novel primes, and two for used primes, and the difference between the two experiments in each category only had to do with very minor differences in the response, uh, in the response we asked. In one case, they, they, uh, they um, uh, reported their visibility reports vocally, and in the other uh, condition, they, um, they used key presses, but this is not important. And there were 18 participants in each, um, in each uh, experiment. And what we did is uh, what I showed you before. There are two things that are important here. One is that we forced the subjects to respond within a uh, 600 millisecond uh, window. And the reason we did that is because we found in previous research, together with other researchers, that after 600 millisecond, the priming effect is completely uh, disappearing. And most importantly, we manipulated the, the time between the prime and the target. So this is an example of a, an early study by, by Stan in which indeed what you see is that if you look at the distribution of trials after 600 milliseconds, the priming effect is completely gone. So in order to maximize our ability to find priming, we, um, 
reduced their responses to 600 milliseconds. Okay, so these are the visibility ratings. What you can see here, this is 0, 1, 2, 3. What you can see is that both for novel and used primes, about 50% of the primes were completely invisible. And what is interesting here is that we found uh, an, uh, um, a significant effect of novelty. So it seems that novel primes emerge to consciousness um, with a higher probability than used primes, which is also an advantage of this paradigm in which you can compare uh, the level to uh, the, the, um, the probability of different classes of stimuli to emerge to consciousness. And this is uh, the ratings for catch trials. And what you see is like, is that in both sets of experiments, um, catch trials elicited a zero or one of very low visibility um, responses um, <coughs> for all subjects and in all experiments. Can you remind me what a catch trial is? Sorry, a catch trial is when there's no prime. Okay, so this is a very important uh, condition because it allows us to um, evaluate the uh, reli reliability of, uh, of the um, subject's reports. So let's start with the uh, semantic priming. So here are the reaction times for the short SOA and the long SOA. And we have exactly the same stimuli in <coughs> the conscious and unconscious conditions. So here we have only novel primes. And what we see here is that we entirely replicate Greenwald's um, dissociation in time of conscious and unconscious semantic priming. Okay, so with novel primes, uh, we still have a difference between conscious and unconscious processing, semantic priming, which is not huge. I was very surprised to see this difference because basically it's like smaller by 30%. And then after 200 milliseconds, the effect is completely gone and it is replicated with um, <coughs> the uh, accuracy data. Now we can look at uh, the SR priming data and to our surprise, they were extremely similar. So again, conscious priming tends to increase with time and unconscious priming tends to decrease. So semantic priming depends on conscious perception, but it's not entirely contingent on conscious perception and it has a dissociable time course. Now I think the most interesting data come from the identity primes condition in which what we can see here, on the errors there's nothing, but on reaction times, we get an effect that actually grows with time and that is completely independent of consciousness. So with this paradigm, we could see cases in which the priming is entirely contingent on conscious perception and this is late in time for semantic and SR priming. And we have a situation in which it's completely independent of conscious perception, which is the case for repetition priming. So to wrap it up, the so summary of the findings here is that, well, semantic priming moderately uh, depends on conscious perception. There is conscious, uh, unconscious priming at zero visibility trials. They can be dissociated in times and when one aspect of the stimulus uh, becomes unable to affect my behavior, other aspects can actually have a growing impact and that's what we saw about the uh, identity primes which reflect perceptual processing. Now, uh, <coughs> the conclusion is that at least for a simple manipulation of single digits. We're talking about semantic priming, but we have to remember what stimuli we're using here. So they are very simple stimuli. It seems that uh, unconscious semantic processing was not uh, uh, overestimated. The present findings suggest a major dissociation of conscious and unconscious processes in time. And it shows that the liminal uh, prime paradigm can be useful to uncover the functional differences between conscious and unconscious perception. Before I conclude, I would like to point out important limitations of this research. The first is that um, 
Again, we have used very, very basic um, stimuli for which we have what uh, Kunda would call an action trigger. When I see the number two, even if it's not in my target set, and I have been uh, trained to respond to three as smaller than five, then two might automatically get the same action trigger. And what we see here might be all of it stimulus response uh, priming rather than truly semantic priming. And this is why we're running more experiments with different stimuli. Um, another uh, uh, important point here is that we have contrasted the identity priming and the semantic priming on the idea that identity priming reveals low-level processing and semantic priming reveals uh, higher processing. But there's another difference. And the difference is that one is based on stimulus, on response selection. <coughs> what we measure for semantic priming is the compatibility effect, whereas the other is not based on response selection because in both cases we have an identical prime that is compatible or a different prime that is compatible. And this opens an interesting question of whether we are not mistaken in using response compatibility effects because they might be the limiting factor and not actually the representations that uh, uh, can affect our behavior. So it would be interesting to find a different avenue for probing um, unconscious processing that does not rely on response um, compatibility effects because it might be the case that very early on the semantic representation which is still well alive does not affect my response selection anymore and this is something that we're also trying to, uh, uh, to look at. The uh, last uh, limitation that I think is very important and might be an introduction to uh, Leon's talk is that there is never a real liminal prime that has constant stimulation. It might have constant stimulation in the world but not in my brain because if it did then there's no reason why I could be conscious on some trials and unconscious on other trials, which means that although we have tried to make the conscious and unconscious um, um, condition as close as possible, it's never perfect. And for proof, we're sometimes aware and sometimes unaware. But considering that there might not be any possibility to, uh, to resolve this problem, I want to go back to uh, uh, Lucia's um, beautiful paper uh, uh, on the uh, prerequisites and consequences of attention, of, um, of consciousness. Uh, something will have to change in the prerequisites of consciousness for me to become conscious of the liminal price on, on some trials. But if we consider that there might not be anything in the middle, and the, uh, <coughs> our consciousness is simply the a passage from prerequisites to consequences, then the liminal pr prime paradigm and the um, contrast that we try to establish between conscious and unconscious primes might be our best option. There is no such thing as a liminal, pr uh, a liminal uh, prime that has absolutely constant external and internal representations uh, to work with. Uh, I want to thank uh, the funding agencies and mainly Mayan Avnon, who is here and who did most of the work. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. Thank you. Um, that was beautiful, especially the condition about the identity and the idea that it, we might be misguided in looking into uh, response contingencies. I wanted to ask, to raise th three very small points about the liminal approach. So could it be A, that the results you're getting in the subliminal uh, trials actually uh, reflect some kind of effects that stem from the conscious exposure in other trials? Because we know, for example, in some of our experiments, subjects could perform a task on unconsciously perceived primes after they were exposed to them consciously, but if, if not, they would not. So in a sense, it might have been that there is no unconscious processing of these primes, but just because you learn to do it consciously, you are able to kind of take them to perform the task also unconsciously in the trials where you haven't seen. Well, I think there are two different questions here. The first is whether our pri prior experience 
with a stimulus is going to influence not only our conscious perception but our unconscious perception and that's definitely a possibility okay the other question is whether what you, you're speaking about learning but this is why we're separating use primes from novel primes so if I have never been exposed to the the, the prime as a target, so I have not learned to respond to it. No, then but you were exposed to it <coughs> as a prime. Right. So, so Damien so in 2001 showed that exposure did not do the effect. Okay. So what they did is that they, they had a, a, a condition in which you were exposed to the stimulus but did not associate it with a response, and you got no priming at all. So we have different uh, findings that I'll be happy to share with okay. you. With and uh, just two follow-up questions. <coughs> uh, one is, could it be that uh, you still don't have the same task? So you, you don't solve the problem of task differences because the task that you perform on the target has a correct answer, while the task you perform on the prime does not. So it, you might still want to devote more attention to the target as opposed to the prime when you are performing the task online, the two tasks. And uh, subs subsequently for the prime task, how do we know that subjects are uh, are how do can we validate the responses? So you have the catch trials, but they only protect us from under, uh, underestimation in the sense that when I don't see anything, I don't say that I see something. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't protect us from overestimation. When I do say I do see something, I still say that I haven't seen it due to some criterion issues. So okay, so that's why the important point in this paradigm is simply the slope of our findings. And this uh, well resolve the problem is absolute invisibility, which I don't think is solvable. Okay, because I have a special um, interest in subjective consciousness. I don't think that uh, chance discrimination or above chance discrimination uh, tells us something about conscious perception. I'll just give an example. Suppose that you're looking at um, forced choice uh, um, responses to the location of, uh, of a stimulus. If I'm above chance, it might be because I saw something or it might be because I'm aware of my eye movement okay, to this stimulus. I might not have any experience at all, but some feedback from my physiological uh, responses to the, to, the, to the prime are going to, uh, is going to inform me. So basically, objective performance can be informed by anything, not only my, my perception of the stimulus. And therefore, I don't think this is the, 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 the paradigm of choice. Although, I mean, from my own reading of the literature, it covers about 7%, 70% or 80% of the research done up to now. So what we're trying to push for is to change the paradigm to something that's closer to our um, um, conscious uh, um, experience and something that also asks the right question. The question is, what is the role? What is the function of conscious perception? Not whether we can have a eight millisecond effect uh, for unconscious um, uh, processing. No question? Yeah. Um, I was a bit surprised by the finding that for the, the novel primes, uh, the, uh, the visibility uh, rated by from 0 to 3 was actually higher than for the, for the other ones. Uh, because for the other ones, you, you, you for, for the non-novel primes, you expect some, some learning to occur you know, between stimulus and response. So that would automatically make them, well, at least in my mind, more salient. But the finding was the other way around. So how would, how would you explain that? Um, one possibility is that something that's novel has special strength, which would be the nice and sexy possibility. The less sexy possibility would be that you are maybe l more reluctant to say that you saw the prime because you have the target uh, th that competes with it. So sometimes when you think you saw the prime, you might say, well, maybe I didn't see it, and then it will go in the one uh, category. I'm not sure I saw it because it might be the target or it might be the prime. So this is specific to this kind of, of design, and so I would not make too much of it. Uh, I still want to defend uh, uh, the liminal prime paradigm in, in asking this kind of questions, because for instance, when you, um, for the, the research I, I, I showed on, on attentional capture, uh, if you look at the chances for something that's relevant <coughs> to your task, like suppose you're looking for something red and you have a, a red prime, red primes are going to be reported as visible much more than uh, green primes that are uh, irrelevant, which means that relevance uh, increases the chances for uh, conscious perception. So, so it might be a nice paradigm in order to differentiate better than uh, BCFS, for instance, 
which is confounded with response factors. Here, you don't have any response factors. All you have is uh, the visibility um, um, uh, ratings. Thank you. It was a very beautiful uh, layout of all the difficulties. And I, th I completely agree with you that the new design is superior and also that we care more about subjective perception. And this is what it is about. I still see a few problems. One is do st you still have the, the prime and the target. Could you get rid of the target, basically? Because uh, otherwise, you just mentioned, for instance, maybe the repetition trials. Perhaps you underestimate their visibility because the subjects cannot discriminate what comes from the prime, comes from the target. Um, so in, in our work, we tended to get rid of the target whatsoever, ask a subjective question on every trial like you do, but also have a forced choice task on uh, the prime, the hidden uh, object, and see how far you can go with processing in a direct task where you ask direct processing of the prime itself. What do you think of that? So basically, what you hold to be your measure of unconscious processing would be forced choice performance. How far can you go with forced choice or how far can you go with activation also in the brain of a certain representation? Um, I think that forced choice is really an ambiguous measure. Uh, on the one hand, it is not perfect as a uh, measure of, of, um <coughs> of uh, conscious perception. On the other hand, it's not perfect as a measure of unconscious perception because um, I haven't seen real dissociations between subjective per perception and, 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 um, <coughs> and um, forced choice performance, except for simple dissociations. So what I would need to see is a double dissociation between subjective perception and forced choice uh, performance, which I'm not sure is around, because what we usually find is that they go hand in hand. So you might have above chance performance when at you're at zero visibility, but this might simply mean that it's a uh, more stringent measure for conscious processing <coughs> or for other processes that are not conscious, but not necessarily for unconscious processing. I don't know if I'm making sense. I'm not sure if I'm following completely, but for instance, with Claire Sergent, we had, I think, what is a <coughs> perhaps counts as a dissociation, uh, preserved forced choice performance on the first order, but destroyed ability to detect your errors. For instance, error detection is completely gone when it's unconscious. So I don't know if that counts as yeah, the but sort it's, of it's, dissociation. It's, it's, it's a dissociation that's, that's a simple dissociation. You don't have, like, uh, an you don't have something that's going to grow on your, uh, uh, on your objective measure and go down on subjective measure and the other way around. So what we have here, for instance, is between priming and conscious perception, we, we see that time affects them completely differently. What I would like to see is some factor that affects conscious perception measured by a visibility and uh, force choice performance in different directions. Because otherwise, it always runs the risks to be somewhere along the line. I, I, I don't have the answer for that, right? <laughs> but because, because I do think that in some cases, it does reflect unconscious processing. But it's still a little bit um, unsure. It, it goes back to, to Victor's question. So you, you could probably actually make a, um, a plot or, or, or analyze how much the visibility changes as a function of exposure, right? And then have that as a control for mm -hmm. your measure, right? So that's one like yeah. methodological point. And, and the second one is in, you in, the, um, in these two sets that you have, very nicely you have that the number nine was never part of the task set because it was an you know, it was it was always novel. So you had like, the the vis the visible ones were, uh, if I remember correctly, something like two, three, You're right. and seven, eight. But nine is something that was never part of your task set. You never see it. So maybe that is your critical number because it goes away from the task. But you it was sorry. It was in different subjects. For so, for instance, one, three, five, and seven were never seen by subject who had mm -hmm. two, four. So it's not that it was in the same experiment and you had the two types of targets. Oh, I see. You have subjects who have only four numbers and others that have only four numbers. So there's the same status for the remaining five, five um, yes. <coughs> novel primes. Yeah. But you could do, so, so that, that but it's. One of, one, of the, one of the digits never appears as a visible one. Oh, so it's always, so, but then I lose the liminal prime paradigm. The target is visible. Tar but this is exactly all the novel primes are in this category. 
Okay, so yeah. maybe something was not clear in my, no, no, in my explanation. So, so yeah. when I'm exposed to four targets, mm -hmm. the remaining five numbers were never experienced as, as, exactly. as... So for both groups, nine happens to be always novel, but it doesn't matter. Though it matters in the sense that, you know, like, so if you, if the ones that you have seen and you were part of your target are like, and this is, this is a methodological point that Greenwell actually has made, like, it becomes part of your task set. So you go from numbers between eight and two. And so okay. You make your, your series, your, your, your All right. associations between those. Okay, so, so I should look at. Okay, away I see. From those, then you don't have that. No, I doubt that you restrict it to uh, to eight when you when you know your ten numbers, honestly. But it would be but interesting. But they have actually looked at that, and, and it's yeah, but I think it was much narrower. So the difference is if like if I'm between small numbers versus uh, far numbers. Here it's only one above. I don't think they're going to be so sensitive to restrict their. They're set to uh, eight numbers, but you might be the case. I, it's empirical. You're right. Let's continue it uh, during lunch. Uh, this is the end of this session. <laughs> <laughs> we, we